Welcome to another AS Movies and Games podcast. I'm Andrew, and here's Gib for now. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here to chat about Nintendo's biggest mistakes. So, <laughs> I'm going to elaborate on the blog post that I wrote about that on the top five, and then we'll just get into probably some other ones that... I mean, I'm sure people could think of a lot once it, once you get going on this. <laughs> top five. Number five was, for me, the Power Glove. I know this is my list, and so I, I kind of... Which might differ a little bit from, from everyone else's list. Well, I'll say I was a Sega guy, so a lot of the things he's going to mention, I... I probably won't know a lot about i'll have a lot of questions though <laughs> i seen uh, the the power club the only the only reference i have to that is when i was a kid and i watched this game called the wizard and it was about a kid who was really good at video games and like yeah his arch yeah. rival had this glove and he was just a badass <laughs> lucas glove. yeah lucas the power glove is so bad <laughs> yeah he's right it is bad but not in a good way <laughs> yeah the the problem with the power glove was first of all that you had to enter a, a different code for every game just to just to be able to use it with that before game. the internet you're welcome yes so if you bought it second hand or you had to look up a I don't new know. code yeah you had to get it from nintendo power or whatever Shit. i i was actually in japan at the time so i wouldn't really know you know too much about the usage of of power glove i'm pretty sure i've used it once or twice i think <laughs> And I don't know that the, that the peripheral even existed in Japan. I, I assume it did, but the witch, like the power glove itself. Oh, yeah. So that was one of the issues, and then the, the second issue was that it just didn't work. It didn't work that great, and like a lot of things that involve sensors. Yeah, like maybe you, I guess you could say is the precursor to the Wii. And if you thought the Wii was a good idea, then maybe maybe you could say that well, you know, it was all just in a, in a train. Or yeah, to, well, to create, we'll have a bit to talk about the Wii later. But yeah, yeah. the whole sensor thing is uh, in the beginning of of its evolution. Just like the beginning of 3D, oh, a lot of mistakes were made, and then you know sometimes they they try to make it better and better, but uh, they go you, you got to make a lot of mistakes to learn. Yeah. So just like how like the sensor from the Wii a lot of time falls off the TV. Exactly. I think that was a problem with uh, the Power Glove because it needed. Not just one stick as a sensor, but uh, I watched some reviews on YouTube, and apparently it needs like it's like a cord attached to like three separate sensors that that like go all around your TV. So and you basically huh. have to tape it on, otherwise. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like if you watch a three-year-old play a Wii, it's a completely different experience than than you know you or I playing the Wii mm. because you know there's that moment of configuration where you're supposed to point it at the TV to properly align <coughs> oh align the controller and that's well, a three year old will just have it to the side to the left and so <laughs> everything they do is like uh, the sensor is just is just way off mm. so I mean that's that's sort of like the whole user error thing that uh, so often we try to correct in, in, in games or just software in general? Yeah, I think when you design something and you have an idea of how people are going to use it, you really have to, uh, early on, you have to uh, play test it. Like, you have to have a working model. Yeah. And then give it to people that have no idea what you're doing. Exactly. And you're like, this is what it's used for. But go ahead and try to use it. And then you can start to see, like, is it going to work? Or maybe, you know, maybe we should not use it as the mainstay of the game maybe we should like implement it in such a way where it's just kind of like an option instead of a mandatory thing exactly so that's the whole beta testing thing right getting a bunch of different people to try it out and get their yeah. feedback and like skyrim did that that right where where you would have like you just play it normally and then later on in one of their connect updates then you could start using uh i don't know if a lot of people know about this but they they have uh what is it connect compatibility where you can mm, shout using your shout and then you can uh, you can swing your sword and, and then shoot your arrow bow and arrow like uh, just by doing the motion yeah but yeah. uh yeah early nintendo had a lot of issues and i think testing was one of them i don't think every game was was tested or just not tested that well and that's <coughs> we, we ended up with all these games that either ended up being like really hard or really stupid like to the point of not really wanting to play it yeah you know so the power glove just kind of falls in that in that spectrum of of early 
add-ons or just early games that that weren't tested that well i can relate i can relate because uh saying that i'm a sega guy i can relate to the power glove as if it were if anybody remembers the activator mm. you like stand in the middle of it and then you're supposed to put your hand over the sensors you're supposed to be able to play games like uh uh, like Street Fighter with it, but Jesus. It didn't work. <laughs> Street Fighter, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. It was supposed to be like you basically stand in an octagon and then <laughs> you punch in the air and same concept. <laughs> like it looked really cool on the commercial, but when you yeah, go to try yeah. it, you're like... <sighs> and to, you know, to, to move forward, <laughs> you like put your hand straight out and... Uh, I feel like I might have seen the commercial once. Oh, horrible. <laughs> My memories of playing Sega was mostly just uh, skate or die. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were staying at uh, a friend's place over the course of a summer one year. I don't remember how young I was. Probably not that old. Shortly after, shortly after Mario Brothers 3 came out in North America, so probably 89, 90, maybe 91-ish. And there was a Sega in the basement that was hooked up to a TV, but I think he only had two games. And for whatever reason, just kind of got hooked on uh, Skate or Die, which was a hard game, I found. Uh, but I, I did at points, I did manage to rack up a lot of points. So <laughs> number four for kind of Nintendo's biggest mistakes that I had was the the Virtual Boy. I don't think anybody would really debate that. But the what? The Virtual Boy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The what? I think I seen it once at Walmart, and I was like, "What is this?" And even as a kid who'd normally go for gimmicks, I think I I looked at it, I played for a bit, and I was like, "This is kind of stupid." Yeah. So you look in the screen, and it's all red, right? It's mm. all one color. It's monochromatic. There's shading, and and the graphics weren't horrible, obviously. Like but Game Boy graphics, kind of. Kind of, yeah. I don't know how they figured that was going to be kind of an evolutionary step towards a better gaming console. Yeah. But either way, you know, uh, I still and and none of this is to say like Nintendo's a bad company. Really, like I have ab from admiration for companies that are willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. Apple, Apple's kind of the same way. They've had a lot of success, but they've also had a lot of products that were total bombs. So Nintendo is really kind of the same way, and so I have a certain amount of admiration for that. But, yeah, the Virtual Boy was, was a piece of junk. Um, get migraine headaches just just using it for an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number three, I had the GameCube. I know that's pretty debatable in some people's minds, but it really was not the best console. Nintendo was still kind of refusing to go internet or online at that point when other consoles were starting to yeah, get I, into it. I actually owned one and uh, it didn't take long for it to end up in a box somewhere in the basement. Yeah. But uh, it's one redeeming quality for me was that uh, I bought an add-on that you could plug into the bottom and it was so that you could play Game Boy Advance games mm. uh, full screen on your TV. So That's I was, pretty cool. Yeah, because I'm a, I'm a huge uh, fan of uh, 2D side-scrolling games, so uh, especially Metroid when I was a kid. So uh, Game Boy yeah. Advance had two really good Metroid games that I can recall off the top of my head. It was uh, Metroid Zero, which is a remake of the original, and uh, what was it? Metroid Fusion. So I basically got it and, and just played those games full screen. Once I realized that I couldn't, I, I couldn't really find any real use for the actual GameCube games. Was there a way to play like N sixty four games on it as well? No, I don't think so. No, hey, I don't think so because there was no just, console. Just Game Boy Advance. Game Boy Advance, yeah. yeah. I think you could play uh, the original Game Boy games too if you wanted to, or, a, or Game Boy Color as well. It was the first time like Nintendo had started doing discs. <laughs> there just weren't any uh, amazing titles. I think the main issue is just that it's a forgettable console yeah and mini almost. discs too so it's like you couldn't use it for music cds you couldn't use it for yeah. uh anything else it was just literally just nintendo games so that's kind of like a a fall off point if you, if you want to make your uh system have a little bit more value um if there's anybody if you give it to a kid who doesn't have like a stereo system i mean everybody does now but who knows back then it was like a big deal to get like a piece of technology if you had one that could do more than one thing it was just more useful yeah I had friends that really liked the GameCube but 
having said that, you know, you're bound to like a few games on any console, right? All in all, it was just kind of not very memorable. Yeah. Number two is where I put Nintendo 64. It is, in my mind, one of <coughs> Nintendo's biggest mistakes of all. I, 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 you know, I would agree with you, but at the same time, I have to disagree on, right. on this. I mean, uh, so why, why do you say what you say? Right, you're wondering. Exactly yeah, like why, why? Why would you say that? Yeah, Nintendo 64 for me it was was sort of the beginning of the end of the decline of of Nintendo consoles, <laughs> and so leading into GameCube was really kind of not, uh, you know, it was was already kind of apparent which way things were going. I wouldn't say that Nintendo 64 was necessarily bad because they went with cartridges instead of. Instead of discs, yeah, I would say that's, that it's, that's one thing that was a redeeming quality because just to have like a physical copy of a cartridge, yeah, that was uh, it was like oh my god, it was like the last of the Mohicans kind of uh, right. This is a cartridge, <laughs> so if it doesn't work, you just blow in it, right? Like, uh, but uh, just to just the that that feel is just uh, you know one but of the redeeming qualities, I guess. That is one of the main limitations of the console, though, and so it ended up creating a lot of these kind of knockoff games that weren't, you know, full versions of, of real games, which is something we always see with console and PC. The PC always features the full version of the game, like I heard in Oblivion, for example. Probably Skyrim's the same deal. Probably. Uh, you know, there's more enemies wandering about in in the PC version versus the Xbox version. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, because I don't know much about PC, but I know you can uh, upgrade, you can, like, modify the game. You right. can't really do that in uh, Xbox as much. So, we sort of saw games like Carmageddon really get ruined. It was a fun game for PC. It was not so fun game on N64. I want to say the same for like NBA Jam or just numerous other titles. So, for me, that's kind of the the beginning point. There's definitely some limitations. I heard like uh, I heard uh, the limitations for memory are huge because when yes. Final Fantasy VII came out, they said that if it was because the, the debate between cartridges and, and the CDs were like, well, what do you need them for? And then they realized that uh, if you tried to put Final Fantasy VII on cartridges, it would be like $1,000 in eight cartridges. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Eight cartridges. And kind of uh-huh. kind of the same deal with GoldenEye. Like you, uh, if you put it on a CD, it would take like no space at all. Yeah. But to put it on a cartridge, it's basically, that's that's the pinnacle of technology for a cartridge yeah yeah then the controllers for me it we went from nintendo which had you know the d-pad and two buttons classic it works you could definitely add on a little bit more which they did with the super nintendo now you had the shoulder <coughs> buttons yeah it, that took a bit of getting used to as a kid <laughs> but once you did it was it worked pretty well and then N64 comes along and you got these gaudy, huge controllers yeah. that, like, what are you even supposed to do? Like, am I supposed to hold it in the middle? Am I supposed to hold it on the side? Yeah, it and, was really... And trigger buttons and shoulder buttons, and it was hard to get around, I found. Yeah, it was really confusing. I mean, I have to agree. A lot of the things, like the C buttons, are generally there to change the... Direction or camera ch- angle. Camera angles, right? Because, like, most of the games are geared towards 3D. Yeah. But uh, still, I think games like I got a chance to play Mario sixty four while I was in the Philippines because that's mm-hmm. where video games go to die. So you get to see a lot of the old. <laughs> you get to see a lot of the old it's games true. that that are like seven, eight, like ten years old, that people still play because they can't afford anything else. Yeah. But uh, so I was playing Mario sixty four and I was like, actually, you know, this is a pretty fun game for what it was. I mean, well done and everything. Well, for me, that's that's kind of the last thing, which is that. There were a limited number of good titles. The good titles were good. Yeah. And, you know, obviously Goldeneye, that was party favorite. I would still play it. Like if we did a pizza party on a weekend. Star Fox, free. Goldeneye, and Mario 64. I think yeah, we go to games. Star so. Fox is okay. Yeah. Mario Kart. Even Perfect Dark to some extent. <laughs> uh, it was it was too huge of a game for the console to be, be able to run it uh, quite up to speed. With, with frame rate and everything but Perfect Dark was definitely an evolution of what you know Goldeneye was doing and I never actually played it really I, I heard a lot of people liked it yeah I liked it a lot it would have been even better on 
GameCube or, or some other platform, probably. So, I don't know. What do you think? Those are kind of my thoughts on, on why the 64 just wasn't... just didn't measure up to kind of the fun and the excitement of something like a Super Famicom or Super Nintendo. Um... Uh. Yeah, I don't know. It was an experiment, for sure. I mean, some things worked, some things didn't, and then the direction they decided to take it in next with the uh, with the GameCube, well, we've already been over that and, and why it's... Uh, ugh. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I think just uh, researching more what works and what doesn't work, but you got to understand that where they're coming from is a totally different point of view because they're, uh, they're culturally, they're from Japan, right? Basically, all consoles. It's it's safe to say that early on they were all made in Japan. Yeah, but then you got things like th their competition uh, comes from uh, uh, North America, so yeah, so they kind of have a different idea behind uh, what's going to be what's going to be taken in. Well, yeah, you're right. Japan sort of had this monopoly on games for quite a while until we started developing things like the the Xbox over here. Obviously, Japanese people are still very much involved in, in some of these developments. But having said that, yeah, uh, it's it sort of come to a head in the last couple of years. Maybe partly because, you know, Square Enix was brilliant with, with some of their Final Fantasy games and they really started dropping the ball with Final Fantasy VIII. Like, I would equate it to Nintendo 64. It's like the beginning of the end. It started declining from there. Oh, yeah. Like, Final Fantasy IX was okay. Then ten had an awful storyline, and then eleven was all online and a huge grind, and then twelve was again okay, but it had some useless characters in it, and then thirteen was god awful. Um, so yeah, I just I have no comment for Final Fantasy. <laughs> it's uh, Final Fantasy seven and, and Undown were uh, great games, but anything oh, past yeah. that, I just uh, what what are you doing? <laughs> five, five, six, and seven in particular are still great enjoyable yeah. games to this day you know if you go pl back and play one or two I didn't hate the systems but um, it, it, it was just basic RPG yeah. right? it was good for what Solid it was Solid for what it is yeah yeah three was three is seen various different releases now so you can play it in 3D and it's not bad nice four was the whole thing where you go to the moon uh, and again it was not not a bad game I played it not too long ago well maybe a year or two ago and then, sort of what I had is their biggest mistake. It was their partnership with Sony. No, they didn't create the PlayStation, but Nintendo sort of played a part in, uh, you know, helping Sony launch their own console line. Now, hear, hearing about this is a surprise to me, because maybe a lot of you will be surprised too, but I never heard about this. Yeah. So, maybe you can... Let me elaborate on me in a here. little bit. Why would they want to partner with what I think, was a, I think an electronics I'm, company? I remember correctly that they were going to try and create a console together, Nintendo and and Sony was. I think I heard a bit about that. Yeah, from from John, but somewhere in the development, Sony decided that that the partnership just wasn't working out, <laughs> and and so. Even though, again, Nintendo did not create PlayStation for them. I think this happened when the Super Nintendo was out, if I remember right. <laughs> so, They're like, look, you just like <laughs> cartridges, and, you know, we're more into CDs. <laughs> Actually, I think that might have been it. <laughs> we, we need to break up. <laughs> so when that partnership, you know, didn't work out, Sony started developing their own console. So even though it wasn't... Nintendo having a hand in, in the PlayStation, it was sort of the precursor to the creation of the PlayStation, if that makes sense. And as we all know, PlayStation, even though in North America there was a lot of skepticism, I knew because I was in Japan and the PlayStation was already out before it was ever out in North America, that it would be the winning console. Yeah. Ultimately. Well, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it the first one to utilize full size CDs? Yeah, I think you might be right. And it, so it could also play music, which everyone's like, oh my god, it plays music. Yeah, and I think like, it did DVDs too, right? So that was kind of another are you sure? big deal. Or was it PlayStation 2 that did DVDs? must have been PlayStation 2, because yeah, I know... Uh, I think so. Was it Xbox or Xbox 360 that did... Did Xbox play movies? 
I, I would imagine so. I'm yeah, pretty sure it came it, out after I'm PlayStation. I'm pretty sure it could. And you know, that's just adding value that was unexpected, and nobody really like. Oh, I get to go, yeah. I, I get a game system, and if I want to throw my uh, music in there, then I can. So I can put my ghetto blaster somewhere else in the house or whatever. And of course, PlayStation and PlayStation Two were sublime systems, but PlayStation Three dropped the ball a little bit, and and so that would be. That would be a whole other conversation of Sony's biggest mistake, but <laughs> yeah. So that would that would definitely maybe it's not deserving of the number one spot as far as mistakes that Nintendo's made, but definitely goes up there because they created a competition that that really kind of brutalized them in the following years. Some other things that people have definitely commented on or mentioned that were Nintendo's mistakes would be the Wii. We've hinted at that a little bit earlier. <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say about the Wii. I, I mean, it's a girls' video game system. <laughs> I mean, or it's my, a casual gamers, I, I guess. I don't know. Like my girlfriend wanted a Wii. She's all into that Mario Party and right. whatever. So the party games. Yeah, I was like, okay, sure. And then, you know, I guess there's you can buy it. You can buy uh, like Nintendo. And Nintendo Super Nintendo games on it now? Yeah, you can. But could you before? Yeah, for quite a while now. Yeah? So that that would be its only redeeming quality for me personally. Yeah. Because like I said... You can play uh, the classic games. I've said before, I really like side-scrolling uh, games. Totally. But... Two, uh, two, 2Ds are great. Yeah. So so I wanted to like download Lost Levels and stuff like that from Mario. Oh, yeah. Just, just things that you can't really All-Stars. get anymore. But then I'd have to buy the classic controller too because I can't stand the uh, the sensor controller. I just well, you should try. You should try the classic controller because it's not as good as you would think. No, I know. Sadly, I know. I wish it was because it was a good idea for Nintendo to do that. Is it the, exactly the same as the old control? It's it's very much like the Super Nintendo one. It's just I didn't feel it was quite as responsive. Yeah, which is kind of sad. Because, yeah, you could just as soon pull out your Super Nintendo if you still have one and bring up Castlevania or Pilot Wings or whatever it is that you want to play. But, yeah, I I don't dislike the Wii. I think it's, it's an okay console. And again, it's it might be okay for casual or party games, and that, which, was, which might make it okay for... Uh, adults too just because we don't have as much time for games <laughs> yeah it's not really a hardcore gamer system no for sure I mean there's there's a demographic for that and it's not me <laughs> it's uh it's more like yeah kids adults and women I think I guess it's safe to say that Nintendo has sort of stayed on that line for a while now you know when you're a kid you don't really notice the cartoony sort of nature of like Mario 64 but now you do as yeah. an adult and you're going yeah Nintendo's really kind of stayed there they haven't really grown up with their audience yeah like in, a, in a way but that's kind of good for them because nobody else really caters to that audience it's true yeah so they kind of have uh, an ace there as long as they can figure out how to do it properly no one else really takes that away because everyone else is kind of going for the uh, the hardcore gamer audience yeah like tooth and nail uh sony and uh if you notice sony and uh xbox microsoft they they try to compete with each other they're coming out at the exact same times whereas uh nintendo staggers their releases so if you notice like the wii u comes out like two years was it a year or two years before the uh, the other two big giants decided to compete for people yeah so the Wii U is kind of a funny console, if only because it's just catching up to where the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 were, mm-hmm. kind of power-wise, and so it's, it's really not going to be in line with Xbone or whatever it is the, the new the new consoles are, but have you had a chance to play anything on like PlayStation 4 or the new Xbox? No. No, me either. So I don't know what they're like. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I can't I tend, comment on that. Yeah, yet. I tend not to want to play the fir- the games that come out first because they're usually like nothing special. Mm. The launch titles, yes, that's a whole. That's other been thing. my experience. I think you'd be hard pressed to find launch titles that are better than like Super Famicom, Super Nintendo, but yeah, because we've we've had a lot of junk, a lot of not so good. Like, what makes it better? Oh, the graphics are better. Well, that's nice. Did you guys work on the game? Yeah. 
And Nintendo has has this classic line of, even though they haven't really been doing new things or anything innovative with them, you know, they they have these very popular lines of, of Mario and Metroid and Star Fox and Pilot Wings mm-hmm. uh, and Zelda, and they they continue to make better games in, in those areas. I mm-hmm. think they continue to appeal. Yeah, they kind of got people. their their own bag of tricks that they can rely on, so they're they're doing okay. Exactly. That sort of g- kind of goes on. We already talked about kind of them being anti online, or maybe they weren't anti online, but they they were they just didn't think it was gonna be a thing with games. So yeah. that's why they didn't really cater towards that with GameCube. And then they finally kind of went online with with the Wii and offered that. Yeah. And s- same with uh, censorship as well, because again they've catered to a younger demographic for a long time. So yeah. even games like Mortal Kombat that would have had a fair bit of blood they they played down a fair bit yeah i've seen i've seen something like there was one final fantasy game where the art was changed for north america mm-hmm. so because there was like a what was it one of the siren bot or a, oh yeah with like the summons yeah or something you could see the boobs or something and they're like they put clothes on her and i'm like okay whatever yeah, <laughs> even some of the original like eight bit uh, like, my Shiranui characters yeah. and yeah stuff like that was was uh, catered towards the kids. Some of the other kind of useless peripherals that were a fair bit early on the Rob bot, you know the <laughs> the Game Boy printer, the Game Boy camera, uh, the N sixty four disc drive, <laughs> just stuff like that that you know these add-ons that didn't do a whole lot for i think nintendo's been doing a little less of that it seems like yeah they seem to have found their markets now mm-hmm. any closing remarks before we wrap up uh, i'm good all right not really big on nintendo anyways fair enough so that'll be our discussion on Nintendo. Don't be afraid to leave a comment in the show notes and <laughs> argue with us because we're dumb. <laughs> Not really. But yeah, feel free to leave a comment and we'll see you next time.